Coach Dave. <laughs> Absolutely. So now we have yes. David coming in. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, we are talking about NLP today, isn't it, David? Yep, so that's a hard act to follow. So just, again, recommend us. My eight-year-old recommends how to save the world with code. And, yeah, we're using the micro bit, and it's great. So give it a go. Yes, so NLP. I suppose I'll try and share my screen here and uh, see how we get on. Let's see. There we are. Let me know if you can see everything. Yes, everything is perfect. Great. So let me make it full screen. Uh, the uh, the full screen has hidden the keynote is always ideal. Yeah, remember the button for oh yeah we're sorry about that. So it better. Great. So what I'm describing today is how to get a computer to understand text. So anyone who deals with this, this is just going to be sort of an intro to the whole situation. Uh, why would you want a computer to understand text? We're getting a huge amount of uh, data at the moment. Like if you're in a company, you're going to have uh, emails being sent in. You're going to have maybe WhatsApp messages or tweet messages. You know, a lot of people are going to send you text to your customers and stuff. And if you can sort of classify that text, realize what someone's talking about, you can speed things up a lot. Sometimes you'd want maybe the computer to think of an answer. But even a lot of the time, if you can just send the email to the right person or sort of, you know, label it right to say, well, we think this is about this particular topic, you can speed up the person, you know, who has to handle it by an awful lot to make their life easier. So imagine here you've got questions coming in from a user and uh, we want to classify it. That's what we're just going to talk here for a few minutes about how you might start doing this with a computer. Uh, it's called a supervised machine learning problem. Uh, why is it supervised is because you're labeled. Uh, so if you think of like a spam detector in your email, that's a, that's a natural language processing problem. And it's supervised because someone has said, this is a spam email, this is not a spam email, and they made up a data set of those things. So what a data set looks like is simply like a uh, spreadsheet. Now I, so a spreadsheet where you know, what someone has said, a bit of text they've said, and what, you know, what they wanted to do. So in, a, in an email, Data set, this would be real email, spam email. Uh, you can imagine sort of other sorts of emails you'd be getting, you know, that you want to say this belongs good to go to the accountancy department, this belongs to the human resources department, or, you know, you want to work out where something belongs. Now, there are big fancy systems for doing what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, IBM Watson, the thing that won Jeopardy years and years ago is one of them. Google have one, Amazon have one. All the big companies have these sort of natural language processing systems where they take text in and based on your data, they can figure out roughly what the, uh, the text is asking about. But um, tonight I'm just going to describe how you can make one on the cheap for uh, just to make your life easier. So in, t in general for a chatbot, so these are like these machines that, uh, you know, when you come along to try and book a holiday or whatever, it understands you're asking about booking a holiday. In general, the spreadsheet that you're feeding information is about 2,000 questions. Uh, and that's what we call utterance, the thing the person said. So you have a spreadsheet of, I'd like to book a holiday. We say, oh, that means book a holiday. We've got about 2,000 examples like that, maybe 50 to 100 different things that people are trying to do. So if you have in your mind here, uh, a spreadsheet of 2,000 things people said, and there's about 100 things they're trying to do in there. So they're trying to, you know, cancel a credit card or book insurance or, you know, those sorts of things is what they're trying to do. Uh, I'm talking about uh, doing this in Chinese, and it's a reasonable question of why someone who doesn't speak Chinese had to make a AI engine that worked in Chinese. <laughs> so uh, the reason is the big companies, the Googles and this won't deploy in China. Uh, the, because they're worried about, the, I think they're worried about sending, passing over the source code or something, but they won't deploy there. Uh, there are reasons why you might want to make your own one anyway, just because, you know, you can, you understand uh, 
your particular domain, what you're working in better than the big guys. You know, maybe IBM understands banks or insurance companies really well, but maybe they don't understand, you know, what you're interested in, uh, holidays or, you know, whatever it is your company works in. Uh, as well, uh, people are getting more worried about sharing data, you know, outside of their own organization. So it's kind of nice if you can keep it inside of your organization. Uh, so obviously these big companies, people trust them and everything, but even still, people get a bit more nervous if, they're, if, if the program that's analyzing things isn't you know, sitting in a computer you know, somewhere in the building. Some people get worried about that, so it can be easy for that way. Okay, so that's the sort of big picture, but the small picture of what is involved in natural language processing, right? It's four or five steps. And then you can add a few extra steps to improve your accuracy, but roughly it's four or five steps. You've got to read in the data. The first problem always in any sort of machine learning is get the data. Then you have to convert it into a form that a computer can understand. A uh, few different steps there to make it sort of easier for the computer to understand and things. And then there's an actual classifier. We go into these in, in more detail, but uh, roughly if you think of reading the data, make it into a form a computer can understand and then make a classifier. You've, you've kind of got all the steps. Uh, images are kind of very similar to what I'm talking about here or even sounds. So there's lots of things you could be classifying. Here it's just text, but if you get the principles of the stuff involved here, images, even videos, audio, you know, you, you, you're, you, the same sort of steps are involved. Okay. Uh, so Chinese is different. Chinese is quite strange. First one is they don't have spaces between the words. So uh, you have to put in the spaces yourself when you're reading Chinese and they use this to make really funny jokes and puns and things. Spaces were actually added to Latin by a bunch of uh, Irish monks during the dark ages. A lot of languages didn't have spaces until the Irish came along. So there's a QI fact about things invented by Irish people is the space. Uh, when you want to run one of these programs that figures out where to put the spaces in Chinese so that the words are broken out to make it easier for the computer to understand, you then do what we call put it into a word vector. This is kind of like an array. And even in these sort of books, kids nowadays are learning about arrays. So I'll describe why you need them. But if an eight-year-old can figure out arrays, you know, we can as well. There's a few sort of weird steps you do about language. And then spelling mistakes, which is always a nightmare. But anyway, spelling mistakes will go into so a piece of text in Chinese is one big chunk and we run a word segmenter. This is like calling an API or running a library and split it up into different words. Uh, this particular one works really well. Uh, I was using it today. They've actually added a load of new features that will be handy later on, which I had it three months ago, but anyway, they, they exist now. Uh, so it's a really nice library. If you're working in Chinese, I'd recommend this one. I've tried five or six of the libraries and this one looks works really well. So ltp.ai is the name of this one. For this step, uh, you really, if you can work with a colleague that speaks the language, it's really useful. So working with a Chinese colleague, a generically chain, trained word segmenter will make mistakes. It'll see like iPhone is two different words, those sorts of mistakes. And you want to say, no, in this domain, these are one word. So uh, baggage allowance maybe is seen as bag age allowance. And you say, no, wait, no. If you knew an awful lot about airlines, you know baggage allowance is two words. And a native speaker, a native uh, speaker of a language can see this stuff really quickly. So this is one of the stages you really do want to have uh, a native speaker with. So we've gotten a bunch of text in the spreadsheet. First problem is in Chinese, all the words together, and we use just a particular library to find the spaces and stick them in. This is five, 10 lines of Python. I'll, sh I'll share links to the code later, but just get the idea here that there's nothing magical happening here. Load the data call a library to stick in spaces, next step in the pipeline. So now we're converting the words we have into an array. So this is a, a slightly strange idea. So if you imagine here, you are saying, have I seen this word in the sentence or the email that got sent into us? So was the word after in there? 
was the word as, was the word become. All these sort of words that you know might be in the sentence. And then you've turned your, uh, the, the email or the, the sentence someone said to you into a, an array of words. Zero not present, one was present, zero. And then you can compare two arrays to see you know, something as simple as what's the most similar array that I've ever seen to the one that's just come in. Oh, this is the most similar. They're quite likely to be about the same thing. So people wave their hands and say machine learning is, you know, magic and everything. But if you just get the idea of in my training data, I convert, you know, all the questions, all the people, things people have said into an array. And then another question comes in, I turn that into an array and I say, wait, which array is this similar to, or which group of arrays is this similar to? That's it. There's no real magic, if you know what I mean. It's as simple as comparing two lists of ones and zeros to see how close together they are. So there's stuff here. Ngrams is usually in language, you just look at one word. You know, was the word Trump mentioned? Maybe it's a news story about Donald Trump. Was the word complaint mentioned? Maybe it's a complaint. Sometimes it's useful to look at two words at a time, uh, credit card. Credit will tell you something about what's been asked. Card will tell you something about what's been asked. The two together, it gives you a big clue. So engrams are this sort of NLP technique and people think they're, you know, they're a difficult thing to understand. They're not at all. It's just how big a window am I looking at? Just one word at a time, that works fine. Get that working first. And then maybe look to see, do you want to have a bigger, or small, you know, a bigger window than that? But it's just, again, in Python, this is one line of code to run it, uh, so it's easy enough to do. Uh, when I say in Python, scikit-learn has this, NLTK, Spacey, there's lots of libraries that, you know, this is just one extra line you add in, check for two words at a time. So Chinese is quite unusual in a few different ways. The way the spelling works, the spelling mistakes in particular, it's different to English. Uh, you can just get one of these off-the-shelf spelling correctors. It, it, it's good enough. Uh, the way words are written is a really clever technique uh, called pinyin, which is based on sound, and the system can combine words really, really, really well. The guy who invented it died like last year, uh, which is kind of amazing. If you imagine having that on like your LinkedIn, I invented text, like it's just a bit odd. So, uh, pinyin's a really clever system. In a lot of Western European languages, which I'll be more used to, you kind of convert the words that have the same base to the base. So if you think of something like consider, I considered, I'm considering, uh, the, the game he, uh, had a consideration of, they kind of all mean the same thing. And stemming is just simply saying, right, we're going to convert all of those to consider and just say that's the word we're looking at. It doesn't really work in Chinese, uh, but stemming again, it's another line of Python. It's nothing magical. Just keep in mind, right, are there a lot of words here in my domain that kind of mean the same thing? They're just different past tense and future tense and everything. If there is, you know, or even if there is, try stemming, see if your accuracy goes up. Uh, anything in language, there's unknown unknowns. Because it's dealing with humans, because we're... Because part of what makes language fun is it's not computer code. There's always something you don't know. There's always something that doesn't work. And, uh, that's why it's never perfect and that's why it's fun. Okay, so a simple pipeline is break up the word into spaces, into words. Break up the, 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 the sentence that gets sent to you into words. Convert it into an array. Uh, in this case, what seemed to work was the words I've seen at least three times, uh, only keep a thousand, which isn't that many words. If you think of it, like your vocabulary is 15, 20,000 words. This system we build here, it's vocabulary is only a thousand words. It's only a thousand things it cares about. The classifier is a, a SVM. So uh, this is like a, quite an old system. Uh, they've gotten a lot faster recently, but they're really quick, really out of the bag. A classifier. The advantage of using a really simple classifier in a really simple system like this is you can iterate quickly. You can say, build a system, test it as a blind set, test it as a k-fold set, you know, blind set test, see how well I did. And you can do that in five minutes. Whereas some of the more advanced, you know, deep learning systems, 
but to, when you hit the start training to when you get to test it, it could take you an hour or two or a day and you just don't get the quick uh, learning. That sort of, that tight repeating cycle means you can try, you know, 50 things in a day, get to a really good answer, get to a really good system. And then later when you have more time, go back for the longer systems, but at least you've gotten a good system quickly by using these really fast different methods. So SVMs, I didn't quite describe it, but if you think uh, earlier on, I described that the problem was if you could find the array that was most similar to the one you've just seen, that's like a, not a bad classifier. You go always, this is the most similar email I've ever seen to this email. What kind of email was this? This is the most similar sentence I've ever seen to this. What was the person asking about? SVMs kind of do that, except for it. They stick all of the emails in a particular class or all of the sentences in a particular class together and then say, wait, how can we divide them up? Uh, so you don't need to go into detail of classification. I think people get kind of a bit too obsessed with classification, whereas a lot of the time, how you chop up the data, how you make sure the data is clean and there's no mistakes in it, that sort of stuff tends to actually be a bigger advantage. Uh, hacks, because it's a beginner example, I won't go into the details of weird little hacks, but uh, basically from this really simple system I described here, plus a few of the hacks, we got to within like half a percent of Watson, uh, which, you know, is quite good for a fairly small team in Chinese. Uh, and, you know, we might go back and, you know, improve things again, but, you know, the next job has come along, so we're probably just going to work on that. Again, deep learning, there are good ones out there. Uh, eventually, we've moved partly to a, to a, a Python library called Spacey. It's really good, uh, but you don't need to go into the big deep learning systems to get like really good results. Uh, you know, scikit-learn and these sorts of things work fast and work pretty well. Uh, words embeddings, I might save that for a, a, a more NLP talk, but basically there's really good systems now where even if you've not seen a word before, uh, you can know that, oh, I've not seen the word luggage before, but it's quite similar to the word baggage. And these sort of word embedding systems allow you to see that. They're really cool. Uh, and, you know, they improve your accuracy a small bit, but you don't need to particularly worry about them. You know, at least in the initial, get something you can show the boss. It'll classify emails. It'll save everyone time. You probably don't need to go into word embeddings just then. Flask in Python is great. Uh, I presume you've had a few talks on Flask. It's really good. Even, you know, I'm not a web programmer, but just using Flask, I was able to, in a day or two, get an API proof of concept up and running. Uh, obviously, to, you know, make it secure and as efficient as possible, it took a bit longer than that. But just to get something you can show the boss and say, look, we can put this in a Docker container. It's ready to go. Even for someone who doesn't do this, it is still really fast. So again, I'd recommend Flask. It's just really handy for these sort of things. As well as the pipeline, as well as, oh, I can take in a piece of text, convert it to an array, see which other arrays it's similar to, and they put a classifier. You kind of want other stuff in a chatbot in a lot of these systems. So this one is RAS. It's a framework that allows you to do a lot of the other things you want to do, like detect the city they've mentioned, and these sorts of things. Uh, so RAS is really good for that. Uh, if you are looking at building a chatbot, Locally, I'd recommend Rasa of the different frameworks I've tried. It takes a while to learn, but it's really good. So anyway, that's a how to replace Watson uh, if you want to do it at home and you've only got two or three days to do it in. There's the steps. I'll uh, send links to my GitHub there, which is the, the framework. The uh, All the code steps are in there. And there we are. So thank you very much for that. Uh, if any questions, uh, hopefully that made sense. David, uh, hi there. Uh, just actually, I'm very curious as to the relevance of Chinese. Actually, I, I, the, the relevance is sort of obvious there. Maybe you covered it actually, I just missed it for a second, but like why Chinese is so important. I mean, it's obviously important, but just let hear us, let, let's hear from you. So one of the chatbots we were building was for travel agents. In, and you know, travel agents here isn't, there's not that many travel agents anymore. There's a good few, but it's not massive. It's not a big job anymore, but there's like three and a half million travel agents in China. So 
like just the scale there is so big that you know if you can build a system that helps a you know a relatively not very common job it still can help millions of people in china so it, it's something to consider that because it's such a well-spoken language and it's so similar everywhere it's spoken it's not like english where there's big variations that uh, a system that works in Chinese, first of all, you get shed loads of data really quickly, which really helps you build any sort of systems. In English, you tend to spend most of your time wandering around trying to find data. In Chinese, they just hand over vast quantities of data day one. So first of all, it's a lot quicker to do things because of that. Yeah. And second of all, just the number of people who can use these systems then is much higher. Okay, yeah. I just want to like, uh, this is sort of like an implicit bias thing. I was just sort of wondering, is NLP just sort of bias towards English language, the whole systems, like the structures, the approaches to doing it? Or is it like pretty, it's pretty okay if we go to, let's say, start in English and then just transfer everything into Chinese? You sort of see with the language groups there. And So there's two things. One is a lot of the very early systems were built in French. The French government sponsored a lot of NLP stuff in the 70s. So actually French is some of the best NLP in the world. Now, having said that, is there a danger in NLP about bias? There is hugely. Like to talk to my Amazon Echo, I have to put on an American accent. Play RTE Radio 1. You have to do that because it doesn't understand the Irish ors. Uh, there's also racial stuff in there where based on people from different races in America have much lower accuracy with some of these sort of systems. So you do have to be massively aware of bias in these systems even in English. And then there's a big risk with these things that if we can build systems that make life more efficient in English, in Spanish, in French, in Chinese, that means that you know you can get your airline ticket easier or you can get your bank problem solved easier. There's a risk there that if these systems aren't built for Hindi and Phil and, and Tagalog and these sorts of other languages, that there's a gulf gets opened up there. So it's part of the reason why here's a you know simple way to build a quite good NLP system in a new language, I think is important for that reason, that someone can take this and go, well, I'm going to build this for Tagalog or you know some other language because it's not good if these systems are purely in English or purely in you know the big 10 languages, we call them, because I think they're really useful. I think they can really help people. And a lot of people don't speak those 10 languages, you know? There was a question there in the chat. I'll let Laiz hang over to Laiz. Sent to nice with Cork accent. So is Langer good or not? It's very hard to tell in uh, in Cork. When someone's called a Langer, it could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing. So Yeah, well, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, how, how do you compare Scikit-Learn, PyTorch, and Spacey? What are the pros and cons of each? So Scikit-Learn has big advantages because it's easy to learn uh, it you can use it for anything if you're doing image processing or audio processing or uh, nlp scikit learn still works the same uh, space is just language it's a really good library uh, so i yeah i really like spacey i've used pytorch i prefer to tensorflow but it does take a while and it's also not that intuitive it's sort of well, again, this could be my my limitations, not PyTorch's limitations, but a lot of the time it's here's a network that we think is roughly right. We don't quite know why. We'll use this. And I think for something like that, that's fine. But you want to compare it to something like Spacey or Scikit-Learn, something you really do understand and go, right, Scikit-Learn was 75% accurate in a blind set test. If PyTorch comes out and it's better, great. But at least we know this simple system we understand is 75% accurate. And then PyTorch has to go beat that, if you know what I mean. I, 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 the deep learning systems, I kind of worry that when you make something and you don't understand it, you need to at least know what score of the system you do understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Comes yeah. Out with. yeah. That's maybe not the best answer. I, I, all of them are great. I'm not going to give out about any of them. And I particularly do like Spacey. I do tend to use Scikit-Learn first just because in a few hours you can get a good score where every step is very, very clear. For Spacey, it is using those word embeddings. It is using these sort of things, which are great, but there's always going to be some element of 
I'm not quite sure what's in the word embeddings and why and what it's built for. Uh, but if the result is better when you're twice spacey, you got to go with it, you know. Hi, David. So uh, I have a question. So it was a really nice presentation, but I wanted to know, like, there has been a, you know, quite discussion about contextual knowledge in NLP. So what's yeah. your take on that? Any specific feature engineering techniques that you involve for contextual knowledge analysis? So, so there's a few areas in this. There's, does the computer understand in a philosophical sense? Uh, there's a great Douglas Hofstadter story there recently, I'll, I'll try and find it, put in the links, where he goes through how the computer doesn't really understand, and that's true. So y you can fool yourself into thinking the computer knows more than it does, but particularly with a chatbot or routing an email to the right person to the job, it's which one of these 50 buckets does this new email or question or whatever coming in belong to? It's not quite the same as understanding. It is the, so in a way you can sort of cheat and say, we're doing such a simple job that maybe context isn't quite as important, but then there's other issues with context where it's like certain things in particular, like negation or time, these sort of systems have big difficulty with. So uh, I don't want to fly to Paris tomorrow. I do want to fly to Paris next week. That's a really hard thing for these sorts of systems I've just described to deal with. So there are sort of logical calculuses that say they can understand these, but I've never seen them work in practice. You know, there's a lot of people get PhDs about how to do a dependency parse to say this is exactly how we're going to understand those sorts of sentences. And hopefully they start working. Yeah. But I've never managed to get one to actually work of how people actually use things. Uh, I think the criticisms are fair. I think context is really important. And those sort of temporal and negation based issues pop up in practice and a lot of the time you kind of cheat and you make an answer that covers both the past and the future or these sorts of things you can kind of cheat with the answer if you know what i mean yeah yeah but, yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so that doesn't quite answer your question but just to admit that you're entirely right there is that context problem uh, yeah. a lot of the time you end up cheating with the answer but yeah thanks I got another question there. Does anybody want to go ahead of me? If uh, another question, uh, okay, so I think the challenge. The, sorry, just reading from the the Q and A that the, I, the chat. I think the challenge is in identifying uh, customized entities. Which approach would be better in building up a customized entity list? So th this is someone who knows more than me, but I'll just describe some of the the what I think the question means here. So you've got entities which are like tends to be proper nouns. So if you're, say, having an airline booking system, the proper nouns tend to be things like dates and money locations. So I want to fly from Dublin to London, you know, and they're good things to capture because you're going to make an API call eventually to go buy a ticket or whatever that, you know, you're going from Dublin to London. So those sorts of well-known things, locations, dates, money amounts, they're not customized entities, they're just sort of entities. They're things that you can get a list of all the cities in the world and they're easy enough to get. Now, the issue then becomes customized entities, which are things like medical terms or, well, I suppose in your domain, uh, the toppings on a pizza or whatever could be a customized entity. It's a particular thing you want on that pizza. Uh, how do you build them up? <sighs> A lot of the time, it's going through the law of this because if you make a good attempt, thinking of what toppings people will ask for on a pizza, say, then you do some user testing and you find out, oh no, there's these new customized entities they're asking for. People do want anchovies and you never thought any reasonable person would want anchovies on a pizza, these sorts of things. But you always want to get some new kind of food that someone's trying to get in the pizza that you haven't considered. Uh, can you find it like a word? There's a, it's like a really clever, uh, dictionary is the wrong word, ontology called WordNet that you can sometimes use to say, give me a list and things like this. 
again, it's one of, it's a bit like the, the logical breaking down sentences. It's one thing you'd like to work, but how this seems to be in most domains, if you use WordNet, you get like five names of foods or you get a million names of foods. And it's just not, it's not practical, but there is only really like a hundred things people want on pizzas and word that tends to give you too much or too little. So uh, I haven't actually answered your question there, but how do you build up customized entities? A lot of times it's a cheat where you see them, people are asking you them in questions. Sometimes you can get them out of ontologies like WordNet, but no system I've seen is perfect. Any questions there? Or... Yeah, I can have a question. Yeah. Thanks, David. Very interesting talk. Um, I, I'm actually quite surprised that support vector machines are doing such a great job. So that's uh, that's very good. But uh, one of the uh, assumptions of this kind of classification uh, modeling is that the relationship is linear. So apparently, it is satisfied. So my question is. Um, do you think if you could use some more advanced classifiers, if it would make um, like a better result? And uh, what kind of accuracy on your model prediction you get? And uh, if, because I know this is kind of data usually, like I haven't worked with uh, NLPs, but I worked with support vector machines and uh, I had to give it up because I couldn't get it working because like my problem was that real life uh, data is not linear. So that's why my kind of question, I was more like, you know, it's it's really cool that it is the way it is, but I like how the, the, this data is apparently having these properties which allow to use this uh, simple classifier. So what's your so what what sort of system were you working on? Uh, well, I was using support vector machine for classification in the classification pro uh, problem, but for different kind of data. So it was not in NLP. But, 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 but what sort of, what sort of data was it? Uh, it was data on uh, uh, like medical data, diseases. <laughs> so and. So you had like a, like uh, I had a, a classes like uh, the, there is a disease, there is no disease or yeah. stuff like that. Based on images or text or, uh, or it was not images. It was uh, like based on uh, empirical data. So it was oh, like data. blood pressure, say, or the things. Yeah, that yeah, like the size of the blood clot and uh, if there is a stroke or not. Stuff like that. So, so effectively, you had like a, a spreadsheet kind of data of numbers. Of something like yes. blood clot size, blood pressure, no, yeah, age. No, exactly, exactly. And stroke happened, didn't happen. Um, my problem back then was um, the data was highly imbalanced. Um, and so I had like 10% or like about 12% positive cases and uh, the rest not negative cases. So for highly imbalanced data, any classifier wouldn't do any good job. But for this kind of, like, as I said, maybe NLPs are, you know, a different settings, but I can imagine Chinese is, seems to me super complex. I don't speak any Chinese, but if I think about grammar and uh, like uh, how you, you know, coding, like I know you just transform data into simple, like, you know, text files, but still like, can you simplify it that far? You know what my question is? So, I, 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 so this is, this is interesting. So you had something like, does the person have a blood clot or some sort of serious disease? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you had like exactly. 20 different, descriptions of them, their age and yeah, different yeah, metrics yeah, yeah. that you're measuring. And only 10%, 12% of people had blood clots and 80, 90% yeah. of people didn't oh. have blood clots and you were trying to make a, a blood clot classifier. And it's a really, it's a really interesting exactly. problem. Yeah. And it's kind of slightly different from what we're doing because first of all, instead of have blood clot, not blood clot, it's which one of these 50 are you? Yeah. And they're quite unusual in that I could have high blood pressure and not have a blood clot, or I could have high blood pressure and have a blood clot. Do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. each one mm -hmm. of your signals wasn't that strong. I'm willing to guess. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. if someone says ticket and buy in NLP, they're trying to buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You're in a constrained domain. So I think maybe that's why really SVM working better in that your problem was really hard. <laughs> hey, real doctor would come along and look at a patient and look at their stats and go, mm, I don't know. You know what I mean? I would want this other test, yeah. I'd guess. Whereas any customer service agent can look at the question and go, oh, they're trying to buy a ticket. So maybe so that's you, the difference, if you know what I mean. Yeah, would you say your data is uh, highly balanced then in that case? So, so it is kind of unfairly balanced in that if you're short of a particular example, so you don't have enough cancel tickets, you go out and get more, you can go find more. So you can 
improve, you can increase the number of cancel tickets, say, and you also you stop looking for more buy tickets because you have enough. So, so you just the, oversample it, or you, you or you just or you chop data and you focus on the. So, so you oversample in a way that you can't really do with medical data because in medical data there's a twelve percent chance they have the blood clot, say, whereas in this you're just trying to land them in the white right zone. It doesn't matter. It doesn't take into account that I've seen mm -hmm. uh, buy ticket a hundred times. It just, if it lands in buy ticket, it buys the ticket. Uh, but I, I, at a guess, I'd say the difference is your problem's harder that someone with two weeks of training can do the sort of customer service jobs that chatbots are good at. Whereas even a really good doctor can't always tell you about blood clot. They have to go send you for some other tests and do this sort of stuff. So just yeah. your your problem is harder, I guess. Yeah. And can this uh, like algorithm be easily applied to other languages? Like, uh, well, we're talking about French or maybe like Arabic, for example. Like, does it have something specific to Chinese uh, which needs to be adopted? Or no. So I, I I used the my knowledge of doing it from French, Spanish, German, Norwegian, English, and assumed it worked in Chinese and learned some things along the way about Chinese that made it work in Chinese. I, it would work in any language I know, but I don't know that many languages. Uh, there's, like, human language is so fascinating, but there's bound to be, I, I think Finnish and these sort of ones have such weird prefixes and suffixes and everything else that maybe you'd have to get a really clever system to break up the words into actual words because there's some languages where Every like I think in Russian is it every noun has certain extra Ending. stuff on the grammar and endings and all this sort of mm -hmm. stuff. So maybe if you could get a good stemmer, you could figure out why they're asking about a plane ticket or whatever. But yeah, there would be issues with different. So so, so those complexities in different languages can uh, have effect on accuracy of the model, let's say because. Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and some languages are just more regular than others. It's interesting and... to see what language is in that respect most uh, difficult uh, because we think Chinese is difficult. I don't speak any, but. <laughs> it, it, it's a it's a very hard thing to test fairly. So Arabic has had a huge amount of research, and that's paid for by the U.S. government, three letter agent agencies. So because of that, Arabic, even though it's really hard and there isn't that much text data on it in the public, is actually they're quite good at processing Arabic. But that's not a fair test because so much money was put into it. But Arabic is uh, like I I learn Arabic now. It's quite logical, you know. Yeah. There is a grammar, there is a rule. You follow a rule, and there are no surprises. In other languages, there is a, there are like exceptions, you know, and you have to memorize them, and there is no logic behind it, which is hard. Like. A, a lot of it comes down to data as well. Uh, it, essentially, how big your Wikipedia pay your Wikipedia for a particular languages is a good guess yeah. at how good NLP is for that languages. Okay, very good. Just, just they use the data for that. Thanks so much. Very interesting. Cool. Uh, anything else no one wants to ask? And uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm on GitHub. I just uh, sort of don't want to chime in ahead of everyone else. So just, uh, I actually just have a quick question. It's about just like career development uh, and going into the field of NLP. So first off, is it the type of thing you learn in college, like as an undergraduate now in computer science, NLP? I, I don't know. I yeah. did a project as an undergraduate in NLP, so... I, I don't know if there's actual many classes on it, okay, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think there certainly will be some. And, yeah. uh, no, it's it, 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 one thing I would say though. It's, it's weird that a lot of the really good people on NLP are in computer programmers. You can always see when a computer program is built a chatbot because they stick in entities for everything. If the word golf exists in this sentence, they must be trying to bring a golf bag onto the plane. Do this, and it just becomes this like gossip list of a million. If you ever see this word, they must mean exactly just this one thing. Yeah. And that's not how language works. Okay. So really enough, uh, archaeologists tend to be really good at it because I think because they sort of respect data or something. Uh, linguists, of course, mm -hmm. end up coming to NLP. Uh, but it, it's, it's a weird area because you're never right, you're never 100% in a way that programmers want to be 100%. Yeah. So it needs to be sort of a sloppy programmer, if you know what I mean, to do it. All right. Yeah. Just hope for me, yeah. No, it's actually <laughs> the, the, uh, the um, 
the lazy programmer. No, it's actually sort of about, like I noticed that there's, when you look at job ads for data science, there is a lot of stuff about an NLP. I'm just thinking about the type of people who will be sort of going back to do conversion courses or masters in data analytics and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, changing careers or upskilling, like what sort of, of direction can give them there or tips or, you know, just get your hands dirty with scikit-learn, look at a few projects, that sort of thing, yeah? Well, one thing I would say is whenever I'm doing an NLP project, I have to find an expert in the area and teach them a small bit of NLP and I have to learn a hell of a lot about their area. So I'm, I'm you know, okay. dealing with so many customer service who knows how to do the job yeah. and you're always, or in some area. So yeah. if you're an expert in an area, if you know an awful lot about forestry or, you know, whatever is your area, and then you want to be a data scientist, maybe NLP is a good choice then because you could be an NLP data scientist, a forestry data scientist, an awful lot easier than you can be just mm -hmm. a pure data scientist. If you know me, because you could, okay. you need so much knowledge in NLP that, and if you already have half of it, you're away, you know? The main knowledge, so to speak, yeah. is that it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh, yeah, that's good. You know, it's just, um, you know, uh, people like who are looking to upscale or something like that. Yeah. That's me, Laise. I'm going to hand back to Laise there. She's... She's here. She's here. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, Lorraine, for, for coming and for introducing the book. Thank you very much, David. It was an awesome talk as well. Thank you very Great. much. <laughs> buy the book, guys. Buy the book. Buy the book. Everyone, buy the book. Um, and well, thank you. Thank you for, for being so nice as well and replying everyone's questions. Um, thank you. It was a pleasure to host you. Thank you very much to uh, our new uh, board members in Python Island. <laughs> we have a strong team now. Very good. Well, have a lovely week. Thank you very much again. And yeah, have, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.